Hi everyone, imagine AI that goes beyond answering questions in natural language and instead performs actions in the real world. We're entering an era where such AI agents could become commonplace. As they begin to collaborate, these agents will enact outcomes that far surpass the capabilities of any individual AI in a form of collective intelligence. Keep watching to learn more. This video has three parts. What are agents, current AI products, and emergent intelligence? Part one, what are agents? Put simply, an agent is something that runs on its own and can take actions on its own. The action part is key. Actually, the word agent comes from the Latin agens, which basically means to make or to do. So an agent is an entity that does things. And yes, humans are agents, but of course, in this video, we're gonna talk primarily about AI agents. The difference between an agent and something without agency is like the difference between an app that runs in the background on your phone and constantly checks the weather for you or something and an app that you have to open up and interact with yourself manually. You'll also sometimes see the term autonomous agent, which basically means an agent that can make major decisions on its own. Not only is it doing actions, it's actually taking the decision to do those actions. Actually, though, the original definition of agent or an intelligent agent arguably contains the notion of autonomy inside it. But I do see this distinction being made in recent AI discourse. Anyway, the idea of an autonomous agent is that it's the difference between saying, please purchase purchase shares of Google when it goes below X price and please continuously manage my portfolio for moderate risk. Obviously, purchasing shares of Google at some point in the future requires doing something, requires agency, but taking on the decision of what to purchase and how to manage risk is obviously a much more major decision and that's what we would entrust to an autonomous agent. Of course, autonomous agents have the most substantial safety concerns, but having any type of agent represents intelligent actions being taken in the world in an automated way. Which which is still very interesting to think about even if there's a human in the loop. Recent news from the OpenAI Dev Day has everybody talking about agents. OpenAI did add some integrations to ChatGPT so that the model could act for you. I think it's cool that the model can now perform searches on the internet, for example. These types of integrations were always possible with the API. It's just been added to the ChatGPT interface. Also at the Dev Day, they announced that you can now create your own apps in natural language. So it's official, English is a programming language. But again, those changes were quite small. Basically Basically just a good interface and an app store. You could always give custom instructions to ChatGPT before you start using it for some given task, and this is basically the same thing. They also announced, however, that there's going to be this option to force JSON output, which basically means forcing the GPT model to produce machine parsable output, which is a much bigger deal to me because it's very useful for agents. If you can guarantee that the model's not going to produce free form natural language, but rather wrap it in some nice JSON structure, that means the model can talk to traditional services or the the model can talk to other models and there'll be far fewer issues. Part two, current AI products. Let's take the perspective of a company for a minute and think, how would we integrate AI into our products? Depending on what the product is, this could be easy or challenging. It might mean you want to use a traditional chatbot type interface, or it might mean you really need agents or autonomous agents. We'll go through an example in a moment, but first let's talk about the ChatGPT API. ChatGPT isn't just a chatbot, of course. By using the API, you can access GPT 3.5, GPT and other machine learning models from OpenAI. And you can invoke it for basically any purpose that doesn't violate their terms of service. And if you've watched some of my earlier videos, you might remember me mentioning that ChatGPT is actually pretty good at using tools. If you tell it, you have a function called email that can be used to send emails, then it can actually generate an invocation of that function by just printing it out in its output. And then you can just parse it and go off and actually send emails, for example. Having the ability to force JSON formatting of the output will make this easier, of course. So this means that the capability to use GPT-3 or GPT-4 as an agent has been there for a long time. And that's why systems like AutoGPT were able to be created. But now that we're all used to chatbots, I guess OpenAI is introducing everyone to this new terminology. Anyway, back to the company's perspective, I hear from people in industry that GPT-4 is actually rarely used in production. And this is partially because of the cost, but mostly because of the rate limits. If you have a serious product that you're trying to scale a lot, you can't afford to have a restriction on how many times per minute you can call the model. So I'm told people are mostly using GPT 3.5 through the API, and of course using other providers as well, including open source models. And oftentimes a company is going to have to string together a lot of different types of models to produce a usable product. As an example, let's talk about Opus Clip, which is the product that I use actually to auto-generate shorts from my long form YouTube content. Apologies, by the way, if you mostly watch the long form, because the short form is probably just something you've already seen, but I don't have the bandwidth right now to create separate 
different short form videos. And this is a way for me to create short clips with very little effort. And they do bring in a handful of subscribers, so I'm doing it for now. Anyway, with Opus Clip, you give it the link of a YouTube video and it will run Whisper, Whisper V3 right now to actually do speech recognition and understand what you're saying in that clip. And it probably gets the word alignment out of Whisper as well. Then it uses, I'm assuming, a chat GPT model to select promising subsets of those subtitles. So it takes a little bit of the video from here, a little bit of the video from there, combines it together if the content's related to produce a clip. It also has some face detection to figure out where it should make this vertical form video out of a horizontal form content. It has some little model to pick emojis and colors for the subtitles. And finally, it uses ChatGPT, again, I'm assuming, to analyze the whole package to see how good the end result looks. It writes out a paragraph describing why it thinks it's a good or a bad clip. And it also assigns an integer score between zero and 100 to indicate how good this short really is. And that's what's used to rank the videos when they're shown to the viewer. So a lot of different models are needed acting in concert to actually produce a useful product. It has quite a high level of complexity. So you might think maybe it's an agent when you click generate clips it actually goes out and downloads a video and it runs all these models for you but it's still a user initiated action so strictly speaking maybe it's not an agent however it would be very easy to turn into an agent just write a script that runs opus clip once per day given all the new videos you've uploaded to your youtube and if you want to be extra fancy utilize that feature in the product where you can automatically upload the results to a social media platform if you did that you would have a fully automated agent that's automatically creating new content for you Anyway, I realize most of my viewers are probably not trying to create short form videos out of long form videos, but if you're curious, I'll put a link to Opus Clip in the description and it is actually an affiliate link. Yes, my very first affiliate link because right before I was filming this video, I realized, hey, maybe they have an affiliate program and they do. Anyway, moving on from Opus Clip, I wanna draw some parallels with ordinary smartphone apps as well. Even apps that don't have any AI in them usually have some code that's on the phone, lots more code that's in the cloud on servers and the app is is only fully functional when it's able to talk to its servers, when you're online in other words. Most phones probably talk to hundreds of servers on a daily basis, even when the user isn't directly looking at and using the phone. So when you have multiple programs or multiple services working together like this, you have the complexity of the original problem split up into lots of pieces, the same way Opus Clip had the complexity of video generation split up amongst different models, and you get a distributed system. Same thing if you have multiple AI agents working together, you get a distributed system. And from this, this, you get emergent behavior, where the result depends on all of the services involved. And in the case of AI agents, you don't just get a distributed system, you get distributed intelligence. Part three, emergent intelligence. Emergent intelligence is the idea that you can have a number of entities that are not very smart on their own, but when they're acting in concert, the result is a very intelligent system. The intelligence has sort of emerged from the interactions between the less intelligent entities. There's a lot of emergent behavior in nature, actually. For example, symbiotic relationships like honeybees and flowers or squirrels and acorns. In those cases, you actually have a plant that's trying to get its pollen or seeds spread efficiently. And even though there's no intelligence baked into this, that's actually what they get out of the transaction. Consider also ant colonies where every ant is not very smart at all. They just follow pheromone trails laid down by other ants, basically. But as a whole, the ant colony exhibits substantial emergent intelligence. The ant colony is able to find food, chase away predators, repair their nest, deal with natural disasters, split into more ant colonies when it becomes too large, etc. This is so effective actually that there's an algorithm that copies nature, which is called ant colony optimization. And it's a way of finding the shortest path, like solving the traveling salesman problem basically. And of course you get emergent behavior and emergent intelligence in artificial systems as well. For example, when you have a company, it's a grouping of a bunch of different humans that have different specialties, but as a whole, the company behaves quite intelligently. It will determine the best strategy to take on its competitors and figure out what its users want, make sure there's good product market fit, figure out the best way to market itself, etc. In a similar fashion, when you have multiple AI agents working together, you might be able to get a system that's smarter than any of the individual AIs. Let me give some examples. First example is internet routing. The internet is actually very disaster proof, right? You can have wires and communication lines get cut and servers go down. And as a whole, the rest of the internet can still communicate with one another. And the way this works is that packets of information go going from one place to another, all go through routers that make pretty dumb decisions about how to route those packets. Should I send this packet to Toronto by way of Edmonton or by way of St. Louis, for example? And these very simplistic routing algorithms when acting in concert actually result in the very resilient internet that we have today. 
Second example is efficient markets in economics. When you have a pretty free market with lots of buyers and lots of sellers, they're going to figure out on their own the best way to route goods, the best use of resources, how much of each item to produce, etc. When each participant in the market is really just trying to say, hey, I just want to buy the cheapest bananas I can, or hey, I just want to maximize the number of bananas I can sell this year, and you get very interesting emergent properties about the prices and so on. Third example is the YouTube algorithm. This is a fun example because the agents, the entities that are providing input to the algorithm are actually humans, right? How long are you watching the video? Are you clicking on the like button? Are you leaving a comment? Which by the way, please do for this video. The algorithm takes into account all of these signals from all of the humans that are using it and figures out what the good videos are. Good by definition of you keep watching it for a longer period. But the humans that are watching the videos are not setting out to figure out whether a video is high quality. They're just trying to entertain themselves or watch something. And the YouTube algorithm itself isn't magical. It can figure out a lot from the videos, but to test hypotheses, it has to show it to some humans and see how they respond. But the system as a whole has some pretty strong emergent properties, some emergent intelligence intelligence about what makes good content. There's actually a whole field called multi-agent systems, which is dedicated to figuring out if you have a lot of different agents and they don't necessarily have all of their goals aligned with each other, or they can't reliably communicate with each other and so on, what are the outcomes going to be? What are the game theoretic things that are likely to happen? And a lot of it is very complicated. As just one example, suppose everyone in a multi-agent system is voting yes or no. How does everybody come to consensus that they all voted yes or they all voted no? That's the consensus problem and there's an algorithm called Paxos that solves it. But Paxos is so complicated. It was described in about 10 papers, all of them extremely complicated, before Leslie Lamport actually stepped in and wrote a paper called Paxos Made Simple. And that was the only one that anyone had a chance of possibly understanding. When you have a multi-agent system, the individual agents can specialize at particular tasks. You can get healthy competition between them to figure out more efficient solutions. And you have easier integration with non-AI agents or even human agents. So overall, very interesting field. This talk of having multiple agents working with each other, by the way, is very similar to what happens in software. In software architecture, you can have a monolith where you have one giant program that does everything, but it's much more common to have small microservices that talk to each other to figure out what to do. These microservices generally communicate with each other by using JSON encoded data, for example. And if you remember, this is what you can now get ChatGPT to output. You can get it to say, here's my answer in JSON format. So you can run an AI model as a service, as a microservice service inside a standard software architecture. Systems like Kubernetes or Docker Swarm that actually run all of the different microservices can be used to run normal software, AI services, a combination of both. And for some reason, people just love the word swarm because everybody's using that to talk about distributed intelligence. And even years ago, when the name Docker Swarm was introduced, they also used that term. Anyway, in conclusion, agents are entities that can go out and perform actions. And if you want to differentiate a ton Autonomous agents are entities that can go out and decide to perform actions. We talked about how current products are having to be broken down into smaller pieces. For example, Opus Clip. So you start to see this specialization of this model will take on this task, that model will take on that task. And once you start turning these models into agents, and the agents are communicating with each other with JSON communications, for example, then you've basically recreated a standard software architecture with microservices that talk to each other to get things done. And there's a reason that it's the best practice for modern software development to use microservices instead of a monolith. And that's because each service can be easily replaced, upgraded, put into competition with each other. You can have 100 copies of this service because it's being used a lot while these other services are not being used a lot. And with software, you get a distributed system with emergent properties, hopefully good properties and not race conditions, but you get emergent properties. And if you have AI agents thrown into the mix, you actually get emergent intelligence, which means that you can take any problem, no matter how large, slice it into smaller pieces such that each piece could be addressed by a single large language model and start trying to construct a swarm to address that problem. Well, I hope you learned something about agents or emergent intelligence. And if you liked this video, check out this previous one I made about brain computer interfaces, which after all is another way of getting emergent intelligence out of a biological brain and an artificial one. That's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.